It's my life says abuse feels like a cult. You have to be secluded to be abused without you being oblivious to it. Oh, with you being oblivious to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, and I've said this multiple times that, uh, you know, as far as abuse goes, there is a lot in an abusive relationship, there is a lot more in common with a cult dynamic than there is with a relationship. Because when you're in, when a person's in a relationship with an abusive person, you basically are in this mini cult run by the narcissist. They call all of the shots. They're using, abusing and exploiting or neglecting the other people in their quote unquote cult, which is their family. And Everybody walks on eggshells. No one's allowed to be, in, you know, individuals. If you are, you know, those, you step outside of the box. You're very quickly put back in the box. It's silent treatment. It's you know, screaming. It's yelling. It's threats. It's all different kinds of things. And so it's be uh, very much like a cult. And having a person get out of that type of relationship is a lot like deprogramming a person from a cult. And trying to get them to think, to question everything and to think critically. So that's one of the trickiest things when a person is going about leaving is, especially, you know, when a person is emotional, very emotionally invested in staying in a situation, whatever it is, a cult, um, a relationship, a job, they're going to continue justifying things because at some level, whatever situation they're in is meeting their needs. And human beings were wired for consistency and we're wired to, to get our needs met. And if our needs are being met in a certain way, no matter how toxic that might be, it's like our brain is wanting us to stay there and to not risk not getting our needs met. So human beings, like we're not really wired for change. So change anyhow is scary, let alone being in an abusive relationship where there's a ton of manipulation, there's a ton of, you know, cognitive dissonance, there's a ton of confusion, there's a ton of like ground down self-esteem, there's all these, you know, financial reasons and children and religion and culture and family and people who don't understand. There's all these other reasons that come into play that can hold a person in there. Um, but having a person kind of get out of that situation is it can be very difficult. And one of the things that I have found to be most effective is I think for starters is getting the person to own the decision that they're going to leave instead of, and this happens a lot in support groups and I'm totally guilty of it as well, but people will say, you know, Hey, is this problematic? And like, what should I do? And, you know, saying, Oh, you know, you need to get out of there. This is not good, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is if that person hasn't fully owned that decision, like if they're not ready to leave, then what happens is if they do leave and nostalgia starts kicking back in or their ex gets a new partner or any number of things happens, they start second guessing themselves, then they're going to blame you for them leaving. And so it's, it's a big part of a person regaining their own power and control is kind of that can happen starting now and to start owning their decisions that they're making. So if a person wants to leave or is toying with the idea of leaving, kind of asking questions of, you know, um, kind of where, where, where is your deal breaker? What, what are your deal breakers with all of this? You know, getting not, and you don't have to share them with anybody, but like getting clear. So, you know, once these certain lines have been crossed that you are going to leave and, or asking them if you're, if you had a sibling, if you had somebody that you loved that was in this exact same situation, what advice would you give to them? And that can be very eye-opening because oftentimes people can see it. We have trouble seeing situations that were that we have trouble seeing situations clearly for what they are when we are in them because we have that increased emotional investment in them. It's a lot easier for a person to see a problem when they're not in that situation. So it can be a lot easier for somebody to say, Oh yes, I would tell my younger brother or sister, yeah, get out of there. That person's cheating on you. They're using you. 
blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's so much harder for us to kind of take our own advice, but it can at least be that wake up call of, okay, there's something wrong here. Like if you're, if you were giving different, if you were telling somebody else that you loved, Hey, get the heck out of there. But if you're not telling that to yourself, then why, you know, why would you encourage somebody else that you love to get out of there? But you, you're thinking that you need to stay. Yes. Agatha says, it's like going to rehab for someone else. It's a waste of time. Addicts need to decide to get clean. Victims need to decide enough is enough and leave. When, when a person is caught up in addiction, you know, there's a high degree of narcissism that goes along with that. And that's the addiction. It's all about them. It's all about getting that, that next drink or that next fix or what have you. And it's at the expense of everybody else, including themselves. It's just, it's all about that addiction. And it's one of the hardest things I think for people who love an addict to realize like we can't save them, you know? And the only way that they even have a chance of sobering up is if they hit rock bottom. And it's really difficult to watch a person that you care about suffer like that. But unfortunately, that's generally what it takes because we can get them dragged away and into rehab and all of these things. But unless they're actually ready and ready to work a program, then the program's not going to work. 